Um, so I'm going to just take you through a series of projects that there's, there's a sort of logical thread in my head um, that really kind of scrutinizes media um, and, and, and looks at the ways in which you can use media to critique itself. And I wanted to start with this image because for me this was really the start of where I started really kind of looking at media as um, a concept in my work. And this was in 2007 when Ahmadinejad first came to the U.S. and there were several headlines including this one, The Evil Has Landed. Um, and I was in the U.S. at the time and I was really struck <laughs> by this headline. Of course this was in the context of George W. Bush's The Axis of Evil. Um, and it really kind of um, addressed, it addressed many things, um, especially in this kind of post 9-11 environment that I wanted to kind of explore. And so I did this very simple exercise where I took the images of the six axis of evil le leaders and I created a sort of random matrix that takes, you know, um, different segments of, of their faces to create these new faces. And it was really a questioning of who can be evil? What does the face of evil look like? And just by pure coincidence, um, one of the images that emerged was one that had a very close resemblance to George W. Bush himself. Um, and this was really a, a coincidence. I didn't do anything to kind of <coughs> take it in that direction. And so it really kind of brought these questions of, of authority and, and, and of, of surveillance, of where do you, how do you find evil in the midst of, of everyday people, um, and, and how do you, um, you know, categorize them. And so, um, Jumping from that point, um, I wanted to uh, address uh, yesterday is actually um, the five year anniversary of uh, the internet shutdown in Egypt. Um, and this was also a very critical point um, and a critical point for me in my own work. Um, and it was really a significant moment where during the first days of the Egyptian revolution, the internet was shut down and it was an unprecedented event. Um, it had never happened on such a big scale before. Um, and it really raised this question in the international community of who owns the internet, um, who, who owns the access, or who controls um, the world's narratives. And um, in these initial days of the internet shutdown, um, a platform emerged called uh, Speak to Tweet, and it was developed by two programmers who worked at Google. Um, and Speak to Tweet was basically a, a platform um, that allowed people to uh, call a phone number with a regular phone line um, and leave a voice message. And this voice message would automatically post to Twitter. I just wanted to show you here the, the timeline of the internet shutdown, that it was actually shut down for an entire week. And that's the longest um, you know, internet has ever been shut down on such a massive scale anywhere in the world. Um, but so this platform allowed people to leave voice messages. And without a third party, um, a, a link to, th to the file was posted on Twitter. And the idea was that these two programmers wanted to keep the revolutionaries engaged in, in, um, in social media. It turns out that um, this actually ended up speaking to a very different demographic of people. And, um, and it was uh, really people who, seemingly people who felt disconnected from the protests who would call in and you know, express their emotions and, um, and really using it as a, a platform to, to speak to the world, which was a pretty incredible thing. I was abroad at the time, so I instinctively recorded all these messages. And within a matter of five days, thousands of messages were recorded. Um, and today, five years later, um, you can no longer access that archive. And as far as I know it, I'm the only person that has this archive. <coughs> so I just, um, this, is, this is a project that I've been working on with these messages in which I've been creating a film of every message. Um, I have about 20 films done so far, and, it, and it's installed within this kind of post-apocalyptic city, this deteriorating city that's away from the media image that we're used to um, of Tahrir um, and the protest squares. I'm just going to very quickly go through this. And then you might have heard of some little something called the <laughs> Homeland Hack. Um, and this was um, really not conceived uh, of as an <coughs> art project at all. In fact, it wasn't very calculated either. Um, but in fact, I was called and asked um, if I wanted to take the job of writing squiggly lines, according to a New York Times uh, reporter, on the set of um, a Syrian refugee camp uh, in Lebanon. Of course, this was being filmed in Berlin, where I was at the time. And, if, and initially, I, um, I rejected the position. But um, when I considered past, se past um, seasons and the kinds of mistakes that they made with language, I considered what was the possibility of doing something subversive. And it turns out that it was actually much easier than we thought. 
Um, we didn't have any contract to sign. And in fact, um, when we met with the crew, um, they gave us images of pro-Bashar al-Assad graffiti, which would never appear in a Syrian refugee camp of Syrians running from Bashar al-Assad. Um, so immediately we knew that they didn't know what they were talking about. And so when we went on set, um, in fact, they were so frantic that they didn't even care what we wrote. In fact, they didn't even ask us what we wrote. So we started playing with it um, and we improvised. We played on this idea that they kept referring to us as the Arabian street artists. So we played on this idea of Orientalism. And when the, when the episode aired, this is a screenshot that I really love from, from that episode. Um, UN guards in front of the gates of the refugee camps with 1,001 calamities in the background. So. So of course, the one that really went viral was Al-Watan Batikh, which means homeland is watermelon. Um, and it went so far as to appear on, um, on uh, Colbert. <laughs> and then we were then uh, subsequently um, commissioned by Laura Poit Poitras um, of uh, Citizen Four, um, who apparently is a new character in um, season five of Homeland. There's a journalist named Laura, so they didn't even bother to change her name. Um, who leaks files that cause bombings to go off in Paris and Berlin. Um, very eerie kind of side-by-side uh, -side narratives, but she commissioned us to make a short film with the very kind of shaky secret footage that we took while doing this graffiti act. Um, it's called, the, the, show, the, the film is called Homeland is Not a Series, um, uh, but it was also her statement um, towards Homeland. And then I just want to leave you with one last project, and it's another kind of media um, his hysteria story um, that happened in 2013 in Egypt when a stork was caught and detained and accused of espionage. Um, and <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> this was in 2013 when the Muslim Brotherhood was in power in Egypt. Um, and of course, it was not a spy stork, um, although there's a lot of paranoia about spy storks. It was just a migratory bird with an electronic de migration device. Um, but I, I um, created a, f a short film based on this story that uses drone footage um, and found footage of storks um, um, that's set to the audio of a 1995 film called The Birds of Darkness, which is about the um, corruption of the Egyptian government, and it makes all these references to birds. Um, and, um, and the main actor of this film was also detained <laughs> in 2013, the same year that the stork was detained. Um, so it's a, it's a play on, on this kind of hysteria of the media. Um, and I, I, I commissioned an Israeli drone cameraman to, to film storks for this film. Um, and I just wanted, uh, the film is called As Birds Flying and it has its world premiere next month at Berlinale. And I, and I just wanted to leave you with one last um, image of uh, absurdity. And the film is called As Birds Flying, which is taken from a biblical passage that starts with As Birds Flying, the Lord will deliver Jerusalem. And it just so happens that the British general, the High Commissioner General of Egypt in, in the early 20th century, who um, uh, took the Jerusalem from the Ottoman Turks, General Allenby, um, had a pet stork. <laughs> Thank you.